Good morning, guys. Am I audible to all of you? Good morning, sir. Yes, you are audible. And my screen is also visible, right? Right. Right. So today is the last session of Entity Framework Database First Approach. Uh, from Monday onwards, we are going to start uh, Code First Approach, right? No. So let's start uh, today's session. Let us start uh, the discussion with the transactions, right? So the transaction will discuss again in detail, right? When we will discuss uh, repository design pattern, but for now we will discuss something else, right? Uh, uh, Something else in the sense it is also related to transaction, but in a different manner, right? So what is a transaction? Transaction means what now if we have a set of a DML statement, multiple DML statements, and if we want to ensure either all the DML statements should execute successfully in the database and made changes to the database data, or if any of the transaction, uh, any of the DML statement to, uh, as part of the transaction failed, then all the uh, modification, whatever done by the transaction should be rolled back. That means it is ensure that either all of the operations are succeeded or none of them, right? That means the job is never half done. Either all the job are done or nothing is done. That is what transaction and uh, uh, that we have already discussed in ADO.NET, right? The same concept is also applicable. The transaction is also not different in ADO.NET, right? Whatever we discussed the main objective of transaction in ADO.NET, the same thing is also applicable in Entity Framework. But in Entity Framework, uh, what is the difference and what we have done in ADO.NET is going to be different, right? In Entity Framework, right, the transaction is maintained, managed internally or automatically you can say, right? So how it is managed the transaction internally or automatically, right? See, whenever we call the set changes method, suppose we develop one application, right? Inside that application, uh, we have done some changes, uh, we have added some new entity, we have modified some new, uh, modified some existing entity, we have deleted some entity, right? Then what will happen? Then at the end, what we need to do? We need to call the set changes method, right? So whenever we call the set changes method, then entity framework, what does internally? Based on the entity state, it is going to generate the uh, appropriate DML statement, right? If entity state is added, then it is going to generate the insert uh, SQL statement, right? If the entity state is modified, then it is going to generate the update SQL statement. And if the entity state is uh, deleted, right, then it is going to generate the delete SQL statement, right? So, but guys, remember behind the scene, right, whenever we call the set changes method, then whatever statement, DML statement, it is going to generate and execute, all are going to be executed as part of one transaction, right? The entity framework will create one transaction internally, with the, as part of the transaction, it is going to execute the DML statement, right? If the DML statement executed successfully, then it is going to commit at the transaction. And if the DML statement is failed, then it is going to roll back the transaction. But the thing is that as part of your context object, if you are calling the save changes method multiple times, right? Then the multiple transactions are going to be created, one for each save changes method call. Right. That means you have created uh, one uh, insert. Uh, you you have added one entity called the set changes method. One transaction will be created as part of that transaction. That uh, insert statement is going to be executed. Right. You created another. Uh, you, you modify one entity and call the set changes method. Means what? Another transaction is going to be created and as part of that transaction, right, the update statement is going to be executed. You created, you deleted one entity and again call the set changes method means again a brand new transaction is going to be generated uh, and as part of that transaction, the code is going to be executed. That means if we are having multiple set changes method, that means multiple transactions are going to be created by default by entity framework. Let us understand this with an example. First of all, you guys understand what is uh, how internally it is managing the transaction, right? Okay, so once we uh, once we understand the example, then you will get better clarity, right? So first of all, uh, to display whatever the SQL uh, code is generated, right? I'm writing this uh, statement, right? And you can see here, I'm creating a new standard object. 
I'm adding the standard right into the context object. I'm creating a student object and I'm adding the uh, student object into the context object. And here I'm calling the set changes method, right? So once I call the set changes method, then what will happen? One transaction will be created, and as part of that transaction, right, the insert statement for the standard entity and insert statement for the student entity is going to be executed and then commit the transaction. Then again, I'm adding a new course entity, right, uh, to the context object, right? And again, I'm calling the set changes method means what? Now another transaction is going to be started. Another transaction is going to be started. And as part of that transaction, the insert statement to insert the course entity is going to be executed. And once that done, then again, the transaction is going to be committed. So here you can see I have called this two times the sub changes method using the same context object. That means two transactions is going to be created to execute the required SQL statement on the database, right? Let me run this application and show you the things practically. Next, let me copy these things into the notepad right so you can see open the connection connection is opened this is my transaction started right this is my transaction started here and as part of the transaction first it execute the standard uh, it will execute the insert statement to insert the standard entity then it execute the insert statement to insert the student entity why these two because we have created one standard entity with the added state we have created one student entity with the added state. And then we are calling the set changes method. So these two entities, right, are for these two entities, it is going to generate two insert statement. And you can see two insert statement are executed as part of this transaction, started transaction. And once these two are executed and both are successfully insert into the database, so you can see here it is committing the transaction and close the connection. Right. So that means here it is automatically implemented one transaction and execute these two statements. Right. Once this committed, right, again we are adding a new entity into the context object. Right. For this, it is going to generate a, a new brand new transaction. Right. You can see another transaction started here, and that transaction is going to be execute uh, uh, our insert statement as part of that transaction we execute our insert statement and then commit the transaction this is what the default behavior of uh, entity framework to use the transactions clear okay right but now what is our requirement right now what is our requirement now i want to call multiple step changes right but i want I don't want to use multiple transactions. Rather, I want to use a single transaction, right? So what is my requirement is now, now my requirement is I don't want to create two transactions to execute these three insert statement. I only want one transaction to be started and I want all these three, uh, three insert statement should be executed as part of that transaction. And if all the three statements, right, are executed successfully, then only I want to commit the transaction only once, right? If any of the insert statement failed, then I want to roll back the transaction. That is what my requirement. But this is not the default behavior. What is the default behavior? That is what I have shown. Now we want to change the default behavior, right? How we can do this? So to do this, uh, what exactly entity framework provide? Entity framework provide two important methods. One is DB context dot begin uh, database dot begin transaction. It is similar to your connection dot begin transaction. What we discussed in our ADO dot. In this case, it, it it is going to be context object dot database dot begin transaction or huge transaction. This huge transaction we will discuss when we will discuss our code first approach because for this this is not going to work with database first approach. And I will show you example of using this huge transaction in our, once we discuss the core first approach. But in this session, I'm going to show you how to use this begin transaction and how we can execute multiple save changes method as part of our transactions, right? 
That means in this case, it is not going to use to, uh, it, it is the safe changes method is not going to create a transaction. Whether the transaction is, which is created, that is going to use data transaction, right? So what this method will say? This method will create a new transaction for the underlying database and allows us to commit a rollback changes made to the database using multiple safe changes method. Right. If this is not clear at the moment, don't worry, we will understand this thing. Say in this case, it is going to create a new transaction. In this case, what exactly happening? Now, in this case, it is not going to create a new transaction. Rather, this use transaction method except one existing transaction to be passed to this transaction. For uh, see, uh, example of this one, I will show you, but for this one, I'm just giving one some hint, right? Suppose uh, uh, so see, in this example, I'm using an NTD framework. Can I still use the ADO.NET code to communicate with the database in this example? Yes. Right? If, if I'm using ADO.NET code to communicate with the example, then can I create a transaction using ADO.NET? Yes. Right. So in this case, if I'm using any transaction using ADO.NET, and if I want that this context object should use the transaction which is created outside the scope of the context object, means ADO.NET created one transaction, right? I want to use that transaction with this context object, right? Then for that purpose, I need to use this method, right? That means this allows us to pass an existing transaction object created outside of the context object, right? So in this case, if I'm using ADO.NET created one context, uh, one transaction, then I can still use that transaction using this context object. For that purpose, what I need to do, context dot database dot use transaction and inside that use transaction method, we need to pass the transaction which is created using the ADO.NET. And for that purpose, we need to use this approach. We will discuss this once we start discussing the entity framework code first approach, but because this is not going to work with the uh, database first approach. Right? So let us uh, try to understand this uh, uh, DB context dot uh, database dot begin transaction. In this case, this begin transaction will create one transaction and as part of that transaction, you can call multiple set changes method, right? In that case, set changes method is not going to create a separate, separate transaction, rather if they are going to be executed as part of this uh, begin transaction. And, uh, and then as a developer, it's our responsibility to call the commit method or set changes method, right? Let me show you this thing practically, right? So in this case, you can see, uh, this is my context object. And to see the generated database and to make sure that the only one transaction is going to be executed by the set changes method, I'm writing this code, right? Then I'm creating one DB transaction. Then how to create the database transaction or DB transaction object? You have to call the context object dot database dot begin transaction, right? Context object. This is my context object dot database. So it is going to create a transaction on the corresponding database. And let's start the transaction, right? So here the transaction is started, and that instance I'm storing here, right? Then as part of the transaction, what I'm trying to create, I'm creating one standard object, adding the standard object, creating one student object, adding the student object into the context object, right? Now, please observe. Here, I'm calling the context dot changes method. Now, it will not create a new transaction. It is going to execute both insert statement within the transaction which is created using the context dot database dot begin transaction method, right? Previously, whenever we call the set changes method, one transaction is created. And as part of that transaction, both the insert statement are executed. But in this case, it is going to execute both the insert statement. That is 100% sure. But it is not going to create a new transaction. Rather, it is going to use the transaction which is created using this begin transaction method, right? And now, again, I'm creating a new course entity. I'm adding the course entity into the context object. And again, I'm calling the set changes method. And in this case, also, it is not going to create a brand new transaction. Rather, it is going to execute the insert statement within the transaction, which was already created by the context object using the 
begin transaction method, right? And whenever you call this commit method, that means whatever changes made by the shift changes method are permanently made, uh, are made permanently within the database, right? So in this case, you are calling the shift changes method, right? They are updating the database, right? In this case, also they are going to update the database, right? But those updation are not permanent, right? If we, once you commit the uh, call this commit method, right? Then those changes are going to be permanent into the database, right? Suppose, suppose in this case, you are executing this statement, uh, or this changes method is executed successfully means your standard and student entity are inserted into the database. But in this case, while inserting the course entity, you are having some issue. And in that case, if you are having some issue, and that means some exception is occur, then the catch statement is going to be executed. And inside the catch statement, we are calling the rollback method. And once we call the rollback method, then what will happen now, whatever changes made by the context object, right? So as you can see here, two insert statement are executed in the database by the context object. Then those changes are going to be rolled back, right? That means this insert statement are done in the database, but not permanently. If they are not done permanently, then there is a chance that you can roll back those changes. And when you will roll back those changes, when you call the rollback method. And if you want to make sure those changes are made permanently into the database, then you need to call the commit method, right? Now, if you run this application, then you will see that, right? Every, uh, both the insert, all the three insert statements, right? Are going to be executed as part of a single database transaction. Let me run the application and show you the output. Right? So you can see your transaction is started here, right? This is your first insert statement. This is your second insert statement. And this is your third insert statement. And then it is going to commit the transaction, right? And then once commit the transaction, we have printed this statement, transaction successful. You can see here I'm writing this transaction successful statement. Is that clear? Yes. Right. Now, Sir, now one doubt. Yeah. Uh, like suppose uh, uh, we are calling the save changes method what if we don't uh, call commit or rollback or we forget to commit uh, call the commit rollback? Will then, the... then this are not going to be made permanently. Da? But if uh, suppose like uh, I have done the changes and depending on that changes, I have done another change, another set of changes. See, so... see, see, instead of asking this question to me, let me do this practically. I, I, I forgot to call the commit. Right. Then what will happen? Okay, let me give this name as entity framework to run a route to right? And here I'm writing a standard, a new standard. I'm creating these things and I'm for, I am I forgot to call the section this move. Then what will happen? What is happening? By default, dispose transaction, right? Dispose transaction now go to student entity. Right. Run the two is there. Run the two entity is there. Okay, now go to standard entity. New standard two is there. Now go to uh, what your next one is course entity, right? Course entity there, course entity two is there. No, that means what? That means you have to call. If you are forget, then it is not going to make the changes permanently into the data. It's clear? Okay. So in case of uh like other other than these transactions, the transaction is itself is ending when we do the save changes method. Yeah, transaction is going to be disposed, right? Disposed in the sense whatever changes you have done. Those are going to be rolled back. Yeah. So in other cases, like previously, the transaction used to happen along with the save changes method. Exactly. No? Exactly. In that case, the save changes method handling the transaction, right? Okay. In this case, save changes method not handling the transaction. We are explicitly handling the transaction. Clear? Yeah. Got it. Thank you. Right. Now, now what will happen? Now, what I'm trying to do is. 
intentionally i'm going to uh, call this a method right so you can see and here up uh, before shape changes method what i'm trying to show you i'm trying to throw some exception so new exception some exception right some exception in the sense in this case you will see that uh, transaction notebook back statement is going to be executed and you will see whatever message i'm sending this transaction file this statement is going to display right so, so in this case the second statement is not executed second step changes method is not executed before that i'm throwing some exception and in this case you will see the transaction is going to be rolled back. So roll back transaction at this time and whatever message i'm printing you can see and the changes are not made permanently because it will roll back the transaction clear guys Yeah, okay. Right. And another another way of maintaining a uh, transaction is that that is unity of work, right? Uh, that we will discuss once we discuss the repository design part, right? Because that is important that uh, because uh, we, we are not going to maintain this transaction each and every time, right? So we need to make sure uh, one approach that well, this transaction should be centralized, right? Uh, we do not need to write this uh, transaction content again and again at every place, right? We need to make sure some centralized approach so that the transaction is going to be maintained centrally. And that is what we are going to discuss once we start discussing the repository design patterns. Right? Clear, guys? Yes. Right. So this is the, uh, see, as of now, whatever we discussed, these are the important concept, right? Few uh, concepts are also there. Let me discuss those, two, but those are not that important, right? So uh, a validate entity in entity framework, right? So what, what do we mean by this? See, uh, you know what, uh, once whenever we are developing any kind of a real-time application, right? Then validation is one of the important uh, feature that we need to implement. Validation means we need to validate the user input before storing the data inside the data office, right? And the validation can be done in two ways. One is server-side validation and another one is client-side validation. In client-side, you might be using JavaScript or jQuery to validate the user input. And in server-side, you have to use your .NET validations, right? And sometimes why, then you might be asking one question, sir, why we are going to validate both the, uh, uh, we are going to implement validation both at server side and client side. Can anybody tell me why we need validation uh, both uh, server side and client side? They could use uh, JavaScript, uh, you can just disable the JavaScript for the um, client side validation to meet the server side. Exactly, so client side validation can be bypassed if the user uh, uh, disables the JavaScript, right? So you can easily, uh, uh, bypass the client side validation, right? So it is whether you validate the data in the client side or not, right? But you should always validate the data in the server side. That is the mandatory things, right? That is what we are going to discuss now, right? So what is our requirement? Our requirement is we are having some entity, right? And we want to validate the entity data, right? What kind of validation? Now validation is like that. So suppose if you go to the student entity, right? If you go to the student entity, then you will see there is a first name, last name, and the standard ID property. And my requirement is that first name value should not be null or empty. Last name value should not be null or empty. That means this first name field is required. This first name field is required. And the standard ID value, even though it is nullable type, right? Now I want to make sure that this value should be greater than zero. If some user passing the value as any, uh, passing the value as zero or any negative number, then it should throw me one exception, right? That means these are the validation that what I want to implement on my entity. That uh, entity in this case is student entity. And for that purpose, we need to use uh, one class. We need to override some method inside our context class right so what we need to do right see uh, uh basically there are many different ways to validate the data right if you guys are working with a, any kind of mpc application sites or web api applications then you might be know uh, there is something called a data annotation fluent api 
In anybody heard these terms? Data annotations, fluent API. Yes. Sir. Are these data annotations? Right. So those are basically used to validate your model data or not? Yes. Right. Yes. Right. So even yes. though you can also manually validate the data, right? Uh, and in entity framework, right, we can also do server side validation. And what we need to do is we need to override the validate entry method of the DB context class. Whenever I'm saying override the validate entry method of the DB context class, what it means, overriding a method is always optional. Why? Because in this case, DB context class provides the implementation for this validate entry method, but that method is declared as virtual, right? And in your child classes, if that method doesn't fulfill the requirement, right, then you can override that method by using the override modifier, right? So what we need to do is right now the uh, client, uh, right now the DB context class validate entry method does not provide any kind of a validation for our student entity model right, for our student entity. So what we need to do, we need to override the validate entry method of the DB context class. And within that validate entry method, we need to provide our custom logic to validate the data, right? So, uh, okay, so if you go to the student, uh, if you go to your context class, right? So if you go to the context class, then once we type override, Intelligence. Right. So override, so you can see that should be some validate entry method. You can see this is your validate entry method, right? So you have to override this method. Let me override this method. And here I have already write, written the copy. Uh, if we have written the code. So this is the signature you can see going to be same. In this case, this is validate entry method. We have already included the namespace so no need to write this one and everything is going to be same right so you can uh, remove the namespaces name here and here you can use i think that right so the same uh, syntax is going to be this one right so you have to override the validate entry method right so what we need to do which entity you want to validate so you can see this validate entity method taking two parameter, one is entity entry and another one is the item. This entity entry will keep uh, the information of all the entities what are available inside this uh, context class. Right now, you want to validate which entity? I want to validate student entity. So you have to check entity entry that entity is student, right? Currently, uh, whatever entity you want to validate, right? If that entity is student, then only this body, whatever you have written, is going to execute, right? If this entry is not student, then this validation will not going to work. So this particular suppose you want to validate the entry for another entity, then you have to write another if condition if entity entry that entity is course, right, or standard, any, any kind of an entity you, you can, you, if you wish, you can validate, right? So what I'm checking, now I'm checking if the first name is null or empty. In string class, there is a property called, uh, uh, there is a method called each null or empty. This, to this method, we need to pass one string uh, value, right? And it will check uh, uh, whether that string value is null or empty. If the string value is null or empty, then this method is going to return true. In that case, this body is going to be executed, right? So in this case, so what I'm passing, I'm passing entity entry, right? And in this case, what is the entity entry object? This is nothing but student. I'm fetching the current values, whatever the current values, 
and the previous value that is what uh, guys uh, later i will show you what do you mean by current value previous value but for now suppose initially you created one entity with the name uh, hari uh, with the first name as uh, ram right then you change that uh, a value to sam right then in that case the original value is ram and the current value is sam right so in this case from this student object what is the current value of this property right get value current value not get value first time and what kind of value you are expecting from this property i am expecting the value is of type string right so in this case for the first name property whatever the value you are setting that value is going to be written by this statement and if that value is null or empty, then in that case, it is going to return me what? It is going to return me true. And in the case of true, this statement is going to be executed. If that value is not null or empty, then in that case, this condition is written, uh, this is of empty method is going to return false. False case means this body is not going to be executed. Right, then what you need to do, you need to create an instance of a DB validation error and to this instant, you need to add the validation error basis, right? So you have to write first name, first name is required, right? First name, first name is required, right? And then again, you have to return that DB validation entry result, right? So this is your entry and whatever the list you have created that you have to return here, right? Next, what you need to do is, suppose you want to check whether the last name is or uh, uh, empty or null, then you have to do the same thing again, right? So here I'm writing last term, last term is required, right? And the rest of the thing is going to be same, right? In this case, first name is of type string, last name is of string string. And now I'm going to check the standard ID property. What is the value of standard ID? Uh, what uh, I'm checking, right? So entity that current value start get value. In this case, this is not a string value. So I'm not, I cannot use this one. So it's a integer value so what i'm trying to say check right if this value whatever you are setting in the standard id is less than or equals to zero then the condition will return true and in that case it is going to throw one validation error and saying the standard id property must value must be greater than zero so in this case i have provided validation for past name last name and the standard id any any kind of custom validation you want you can implement here right so currently i'm providing this uh, validation for these three properties clear guys yes sorry clear now yes okay so once you have done the validation part right then what you need to do, right? So that's it. So in the now, or the uh, validation is going to throw some error, right? So in that case, you can see I'm creating one context object. I'm creating the database log, whatever the statement is going to be executed and uh, executed on the database, right? But guys, remember, uh, before executing, uh, before once you call the step changes method, right? Those validations of each entity is going to be checked. And if the validation failed, then it is not going to generate the insert statement or update statement. Rather, it is going to throw the error message, right? So uh, in that case, you can see first name is Rohit and I'm putting the last name as empty. In this case, I'm putting the first name uh, as null and the last name as Kumar. In this case, I'm putting the first name as Rohit, last name as Kumar and the standard ID value is going to be minus one. And in this case, I'm putting the standard ID value as one. So, so this in this case, we are having one validation error. In this case, we are having another validation error for the first name. In this case, we are having the validation error for standard ID. And in this case, we do not have any validation error, right? So now let me run the application before running. So in this case, as you know, what kind of error it is throwing a DP validation error, right? DP entry validation error right so you can see db entry validation result and from this result i'm fetching individual validation error message right in this case it might be having one validation for first name one valid one validation for this last name right one validation for this standard id so if you want to fetch each validation error then you have to go through this loop and in this case whatever the property right 
which is throwing the validation and whatever the error message we are setting, that is what it is going to print, right? Now, let me run the application and see the output. Right, so you can see uh, error property name, last name, error message, last name is required. Error property name, first name, error message is First name is required. Error property name standard ID. Error message standard ID value must be greater than zero. So this is how you need to implement uh, uh, entity validation using entity framework. Clear, guys? Yes. Right. So, uh, so this is very simple and straightforward. Right. Uh, you do not need to remember many uh, much more. Right. So you just need to write this logic. Right. You have to check the entity step. And here, if you are finding very difficult, right, then just remove these things, right? If you are thinking, of, oh, what are these things, right? These are nothing but the namespace, right? So this is the thing, right? You can simply ignore the uh, namespace, right? Because we have included those uh, that namespace here, right? This is how you need to validate the entity in entity framework. Clear, guys? Yes. Right. The next important, uh, uh, are not that important because these are the not important things, right? Whatever important we have already discussed, right? So next, uh, uh, what we are going to discuss is a DB entity class, right? So DB entity class is one of the important, is one of, is one of the important class in entity framework, is one of the important classes in entity framework. Right, the entity, this entity, DB entity class is useful in retrieving various information of an entity, right? You can get an instance of a DB entity type of a particular entity by calling the entry method on the DB context object by passing the entity, right? Suppose you want, okay, let me show you uh, this thing practically, uh, right? Suppose you created one entry, suppose here, why I'm getting these errors? In class is wrong. When you have pasted field data model context class. Sorry? You have written in uh, context class. It should be written in program class. So I think names bit is No, no. Oh, right, right. So I have copy paste this inside the context class. That is the issue, right? So we have to copy paste this inside the program class, right? So in this case, you can see, uh, first of all, I'm fetching one entity from the database uh, using the find method whose primary key value is one, right? So one entity is uh, written here. And then I'm uh, modifying the first name and the last name. And then I want to uh, get the entity information, right? If you want to get the entity information, then what you need to do, you need to create an instance of a DB entity entry class. Then how you are creating an instance of a DB entity entry class means you need to call the entry method on the context object by passing the entity, right? So in this case, student is the entity. You need to call the entry method on the context object and passing the student entry. And this is going to return me one DB entity entry, right? So in this case, it is going to return me DB entity entry, right? So in Shnavar, you can write DB entity entry, right? And this is available in a different namespace, bring that namespace. So this is your student entry entity right now. Now using this entity, right you can access you can page all the information what is your entity type whether it is a OCO entity or whether it is a uh, what i can say a uh, dynamic entity what is the entity full name right get entity state what is the state of the entity right and then whatever the property name what is its original value right so, uh, i have shown you there are two things one is current values and the one is original value what is the original value? What is the current value, right? So in this case, uh, in this case, you can see 
uh, initially what, what value we are storing okay let me open the student database table so first name is updated okay let me access the value of uh, id2 right so here i'm uh, accessing the value of id2 so for the employee two, first name is Rohit and second uh, last name is Sharma. That in this original value, you will find the first name value as Rohit and last name value as Sharma. And in the current values, right, whatever value you have updated, right, those value you are going to get inside this current values property, right? Right. Let me run this application. Right. So now, guys, tell me what kind of a pro, uh, object is this? This is a Poco entity or it's a dynamic proxy? Dynamic proxy. Dynamic proxy. Right. You can see uh, the entity type. Right? It is not giving you the entity type as uh, what uh, your class interface, uh, your class name, and the model. Uh, your class name uh, followed by the uh, your column namespace name. It is giving you a different name, right? So, can anybody tell me how I can disable dynamic proxy? So, context dot. So, any configuration, you have to use the configuration dot. What is proxy creation enabled? What, are, what value I need to set? All right. Once you set this, right, then the proxy creation enabled for this context object is going to be false. And in this case, you can see db first approach dot student right so entity full name right so let me check these things entity full name this is your db first approach to student who is giving this full name db uh, db entity entry giving you the entity full name right then what is the entity state this db entity entry this class instance also giving you the entity state Whatever the property name, what is its original value, what is its current value, every information you are getting from this DB entity entry instance, right? Property name, right? How you are getting the property name? By using this collection. So here we are going through this current value stored property name. So this will return you all the properties that are available inside the student entity. And using each property, we can access the original value using the original value indexer and current value you can access by using the current value indexer but from where you are accessing from the student end right so you can see name equals to suppose the first one first property is student id that student id you are printing what is the student id value what is the student id original value of the student entity right that is what you are printing here what is the student ID current value of the student entity that what you are printing here? Once that is completed, again, the loop will execute for the next property. What is the next property? First name. What is the original value, Rohit? What is the updated uh, value or the current value? Uh, first name modified, right? And same for the last name, I understand the ID properties, right? So basically, this is one of the important class provided by uh, the entity framework, which is basically going to give you um, most of the information, right? Useful information about your entity. Clear? What is the entity type? What is the entity state? What is the entity original value? And what is the entity uh, updated or current value? But most of the time, this is not going to be used in any of your real-time application, right? This class is, right, class is internally used by the entity framework, right? But we should know how it is actually maintaining the state of each entity. And for that purpose, it is using this DB entity entry class. Clear, guys? Yes. Right. These are the, uh, um, uh, I mean, uh, from your development point of view, you are never going to use this thing, right? But if you know uh, this thing, then th this is good, right? So, so sometimes you want to track uh, why I'm not getting this property value, right? So you have added some uh, column in your entity, but the, those columns are not updated into the database. Why it is not updating into the database, right? You can use this for loop and you can check what is the value you are setting, whether these uh, values are uh, uh, actually storing inside this entity or not, right? For that debugging purpose, you can use this thing, right? Hello? 
right the next one is what we are going to discuss is change tracking again uh, this is uh, one of the important concept right which is internally managed by the entity framework right as a developer it is not uh, that important right for us, but if we know how this change tracking is work, then it is good to us, right? Let us understand how entity framework track changes on entities during their lifetime, right? The entity framework support automatic change tracking of the attached entities during the lifetime of the context, right? That means what? It means once you attach one entity, right, into the context object, right, then that entity is going to be tracked by the uh db context class right but if you are detaching one entity right then that entity if, if any entity with a detached state then that is not going to be tracked by the entity uh db context class or by entity framework right so how exactly it is maintaining or how exactly it is tracking the en entity information right for that purpose the entity framework uses one class called a db change tracker the DB change tracker class is actually used by entity framework and this class will give you information about the current entities which are being tracked by the context object, right? So if you are attaching, detaching many objects into the context object, right? Then whichever entities are currently tracked by the context object, right? All the entity information are going to be given by this DB change tracker class. But, but guys, remember one thing, right? Every entity must have a primary key property in order to be tracked by the context object, right? If you are tracking one entity, then that entity should and must have the primary key object. If primary key is not there, then the context object will not track that entity. Clear? So let me show you this with one example. Right? So this is, uh, so this statement basically I'm using to disable the uh, dynamic proxy so that I can see the actual entity type, right? So in this case, find student whose student ID is one. So in this case, the student entity is created. And in this case, what should be the student entity state? Guys, Guys, unchanged. Unchanged, right? So in this case, the student entity said it's going to be unchanged, right? And at this moment, right? At this moment, right? At, at, at this moment means at the end of line number 16, the context object have been tracking how many entities? One, two, three, or how many entities are going to be tracked by the context object at the end of a line number 16? Can anybody tell me? One. One. So in this case, in this case, context dot change tracker dot entry the count method is going to return me the value one. Why one? Because currently the context object is tracking one entity and that count you can get by using this count function on the entries method and you have to call on the change tracker, right? So count is one and this change tracker instance, right? Going to contain the information of all the entities, right? So in this case, I'm calling this display tracked entities method by passing that change tracker, right? Now, let me go to the definition of this method. Then what this method is going to do, it is expecting the DB change tracker instance. That is what I'm passing from that method. And this change tracker is going to keep information of all the entities which are currently tracked by the context object, right? So in this case, how many entries it will find? How one. many entries? Only one entry, right? That means this for loop is going to execute for how many times? One time. So one. In, this case, in this case, what should be the entity state? What should be the entity state? On change And in this case, what should be the entity full name? Student entity. What is the namespace name? Dot student name, right? Now, now what I'm trying to do, uh, this part is dot, right? This part is dot and we have understood this, right? Now what I'm trying to access, I'm accessing standard entity, right? I'm accessing the first standard, right? At, at the end of line number 23, 
so now just tell me how many entities are attracted by the context object in this case two two what are those one is the student entity which we already uh, which is already tracked by the context object and in this case one and entity name is going to be student and entity state is going to be what unchanged right so in this case how many entities two entities what are the two entities one is student with unchanged state right student with unchanged state and the other one is right standard with what state is unchanged unchanged and all this information uh, uh, so in this case once you run this up uh, in this particular time it should print you the number of entities are true and this context chart change tracker what i am passing down to this dp context method right that change tracker current uh, having now two entries that means this for each loop will execute for how many times two times one time for the student entity and another time for the standard entity in this case it will display the student uh, entity name right and then it will display the entity state clear guys yes right we have completed this we have completed this much right now now i'm editing the standard entity right so once i'm editing the standard entity so at this particular time right at, at, at the end of this so how many entities are going to be there two two entity student entity is on change state and what about the standard entity what should be the state of the sorry in this case updating this is student right not standard so in this case a uh, student entity we are updating the first time then what should be the state modified body right. and what should be the state of the standard and change still we have not made in any changes right now so in this case i have updated the uh, standard entity that means student is modified standard is also going to be modified right yes so now now uh, just tell me in this case i'm creating a new teacher object and attaching that teacher into the context object so in this case Total entity count will be three. Three. Student is modified, standard is modified. And what about the okay? Let me give this name as teacher. T E A C H E R. Right. Teacher. And here, what should be the teacher more entity state? What is the entity state? Modified. Modified. Uh, added. 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 The state should be added because we are adding. This is a new entity and we are adding that new entity. So the state should be added. Clear? Yes. Right. So now the change tracker will give this information. Right. Now I'm removing one entity from the context object. Right. Then how many entities are there in, in the context object? Two. Three entities are still there, right? Because if you remove until and unless it is not removed from the database, the state is not changed to or, or detached, right? Still, this entity is there, but in this case, the student entity state will be deleted, right? When one uh, when the context class is not going to track, when the state is detached or deleted. Detached. Detached. So in this case, this is a student entity. This entity is only available in the context object or available in the database. In the context of. In the context. This entity is not available in the database. From where you are fetching the entity? 
it is available in the database but not in the context sorry so if you remove from the context it will be no, removed. no I, I'm, I'm not talking about the remove method i'm just talking about this entity is available in the database or not yes, yes. if it is available in the database when you call the remove method then what will happen it will delete the data from the database or it will simply change the entity state as it deleted remove the data from database uh, uh, it will remove the data am i calling the set changes method no then how it is going to remove the data from the database guys you are getting uh, you are only making me confused right see i'm having i'm having one student entity one i'm having student entity two right so this is one existing entity right this is an existing entity existing entity and this is a new entity new entity right so new entity means this is added right by using the add method and this is one entity let assume that we are fetching this entity using the find method by passing some id column value one so this is one entity so the context object right the context object will track this entity state uh, at this particular time what unchanged unchanged right in this case right in this case the context object will track the student to entity add as what state? Added. Added. In this case, what I'm doing, I'm making, the, I'm removing the student uh, one entity. I'm removing the student one entity. So in this case, what will be the state of the entity? Deleted. Deleted. In this case, I am removing the entity from the, uh, uh, I'm removing the student to entity. In this case, what should be the state? Deleted. deleted. In this case, the state is not going to be deleted. It is going to be detached. Why it is going to be detached? Because this is a new entity. New entity means it is not only available in the context object. This is not available in the database. If it is not available in the database, right? Once you call the remove method, the state is going to be detached. And once the state becomes detached, then it is not tracked by the context class. Context object anymore. Right. In this case, in this case, as the entity state is deleted, so it is going to be tracked by the context object. Right. So in this case, the context object is tracked by the. Uh, sorry, in this case, the object is tracked by the context object. Right. Now I'm calling the set changes method. Right. Now I'm calling the set changes method. What should the entity state now become? Detached. In this case, it will become detached. And once it becomes detached, then only it is going to not attract by the entity object right so point that you need to remember if the entity is available in the database then only when you call the remove method the state will be moved to deleted if the entity is not available in the database you only add it to the context object and you are only going to remove from the context object then in that case the state is going to be detached right and in this case if you call the set changes method nothing going to be happening so in this case, set changes method means nothing is going to happen because there is no script is going to be generated for the deletion because this data, uh, uh, right, this entity, what you are going to delete, it is not available in the database. So in this case, it is going to generate to what SQL statement? It is going to generate delete SQL statement, right? And in this case, if you are calling set changes, then no SQL. Clear? Yeah. Any question from anyone? No. Yeah. Right. So in this case, you just tell me, in this case, I'm calling the remove method. 
right? If I am calling the remove method, then the student state is going to be deleted. But still, it is tracked by the context object or not? Yes. So the entities, number of entities is still going to be three. And in this case, the student entity state is going to be deleted. And if you call the safe changes method, then that is going to be removed from the context object and the entity state is going to be two. And I'm not going to remove that one. So I'm just showing this thing, right? Now, let me run the application and see the output. Right. So initially find student. So one entry is there. And what is the name of the entity student? And what is the state on chain? Then we have added, uh, we have added the standard entity, right? We have fetched the standard whose ID is one. So once you fetch this standard entity, right? So the number of entities is tracked by the context object is two. One is student entity, another is standard entity. And the, both the entity state are unchanged, right? Then you are editing the student entity. Editing student entity. Okay. So this value is already there. Let me mark this as two. Let me mark this as a two. Right, so right. So you can see the first first time you fetch the student data, uh, which state is unchanged, right? And when you fetch the standard entity, so currently the tracking the context object, the DP change tracker tracking two entities, right? One is student entity, another one is it. Uh, standard entity and both are having the state as unchanged, right? Then you are editing the student entity, right? Once you edit the student entity, the student entity state is modified as modified, right? The student entity update means the state is changed to modified, but still the standard entity state is unchanged, right? And when you edit the standard entity, right, then you will see Previously, the student entity state is modified. Now you edit the standard entity. So standard entity state is also changed to modified, right? Now you are adding teacher entity into the context of the once you are teacher means the number of entities is going to be three, right? And what is the state of the teacher? It is going to be added state, right? And then I'm removing the student entity from the context object. So you can see teacher entity state is added standard entity state is modified, but student entity state is deleted. Clear? Yes. Right, this is how the DP change tracker tracking the state of uh, each entity. Okay, let me put this example. Right, I'm putting this one. Right, let me put the output also. Right. So, so basically, whenever you add entity, modify entity, right, uh, delete entity, update any existing entity, then all the information is going to be tracked by the entity framework. And this is going to be, and this is possible by using this DB change tracker class, right? It is tracking information of all the entities uh, which are tracked by the context object, right? That information you can get from this DB change tracker class. Clear, guys? Yes. Right. So the last thing what we are going to discuss today is logging database command. We have already discussed this thing, but uh, we'll enhance the, uh, we'll discuss something new in this session, right? So basically prior to entity framework six, right? Currently we are learning entity framework six, right? If you are not using entity framework six, if we are using some lower version, 
then whatever we are uh, using right, right now. So you can see uh, we are having something called a database dot, uh, uh, what I can say, right? So currently we are using context dot database dot log, right? So what I'm using this approach to log the data in, uh, to log the database command in the console this is only possible or only available in entity framework 6 right if you are not using entity framework 6 and if you are prior to entity framework 6 right then we as a developer generally use some third party uh, tools to track the generated sql statement right and the, one of the very useful tool is sql profiler we have already discussed this thing right how to track the uh, is generated SQL by using SQL profiler, which is sent by the entity framework. We have uh, we need to use this third party tool. But from entity framework six, right? We can use this log property, right? We can use this log property to log the generated SQL, right? Uh, um, generated SQL by the entity framework. So what this log property is saying? So this property said this property to log the SQL generated by the DB context object to the given delegate. So what exactly it means is now in this log property, you need to set one delegate where it is going to log the uh, data, right? So to understand this thing, right? Uh, let me copy this code, right? So in this case, so this log property saying, Yes, you have to set one uh, delegate to this log property. You need to set one delegate to this log property, right? So what is saying? Now set this property, you need to set this property to log the SQL generated by the DB context class to the given delegate, right? For example, to log to the console, set this property to system.console.write, right? Now you can see I'm using system.console.write, right? So to log the uh, SQL, into this delegate. So this is nothing but one delegate. So how you can say it's a delegate, right? So you need to understand, okay, let's go to the definition of this log. What is the type of this log? The type is action of a string. Now go to the definition of action, uh, right? Now go to the definition of action. So then you will see that it's a delegate. What is the return type of this delegate? The delegate return type is void, right? And what is the input parameter, right? It is expecting, it is expecting a input parameter of string and it is this delegate the return type is void and it is expecting one input parameter, which is of type string right now. Now, if you go to the definition of this right method, right? Does this right method taking one string value and return type is void? Yes, yes. or no? That means here uh, to this, uh, log property, you need to specify one delegate whose return type is going to be void and who's, who is taking one input parameter of string. So delegate means what? You need to specify one method whose signature is the same as the delegate signature, right? And in this case, this uh, console.write method signature is the same as your action of string delegate. So you can specify that console.write here. Now, this log method will generate, uh, right? Now this log method, what it is going to do? It is going to log the con database command, which is generated by the context object inside this uh, console.write method, right? So it, so it basically going to send, see in this case, the context class is going to generate the database command, which is going to be sent to the database for execution. Whatever command it is sent to the database for execution, right? along with those command, right? When the connection is open, right? When the connection is closed, when the transaction is started, when the transaction is completed, whether the transaction is completed with committed or the transaction is committed with rolled back, every information it is going to log, right? Every information it is going to log. And in this case, it will send those information to this right method, right? So now if you run the application, then you will see that, right? All the information, not only the database command, but also when the transaction started, how it executes the C, open the connection. So in this case, there is no DML statement, so no transaction, right? When the connection is open, what SQL statement is executed? 
how it is executing the SQL statement. It is executing the SQL statement with SQL reader, right? And when the connection is closed, every information it is logging into this uh, console window. And in this case, uh, why it is on the console window? Because what, whatever, see, whatever information we pass to this right method, the right method is going to write those things on the console window, right? So in this case, it is writing the database or related information inside this console window. Clear, guys? Yes. Right? So this is how it is going to print the data, right? Now, now what my requirement is, can I use my custom class to log the data? Yes, you can use your custom class instead of using, right? So instead of using, Okay, let me give this name as two, right? So instead of using, uh, okay, so right, console dot right, right. So in this case, you can see I'm having one uh, uh, select statement, and I, I'm, I, when I call this changes method, it should have one operate statement, right? Then it should have some transaction. Right, so let me show you this thing before moving further, right? So you can see connection is open. This is my select statement. For select statement, transaction is not required, right? And close the connection. Then you can see it is open the connection. Again, it is start the transaction. When the transaction started, when the transaction is completed, the time, the time is also it is going to print. And what a SQL statement is it executing, right? Those things. And when whether this transaction is committed or rolled back and when the uh, it closed the connection. Every information it is printing on the console portal. Now, instead of this console dot write method, so what I'm going to do, I'm going to create my own logger class. So I'm creating one class called a DB logger. And inside this DB logger class, I'm having one method called a DB log. And this method taking one string parameter and the return type is void. Is this method uh, signature is same as the action delegate what this log method expecting? Same or different? Return type is void, taking one string parameter, right? Now, if you go to this, the input parameter is string. And if you go to the definition, the return type is void. That means this input parameter, right? Uh, this method, what we defined, it is exactly same as the method, right? Uh, or what it is expecting, right? So in this case, what I'm trying to do, I'm just going to use this db logger class to log the database command, right? So what I'm trying to do, <clears throat> db logger, and instead of this right method, what I'm going to do is db log, right? First name operator three, right? So I have written this statement, right? So now if you run the application, and guys, remember this method taking one string parameter returning word means the signature, uh, what delegate this log method except that delegate signature is matched with this method signature. That's fine. Second string, now it's up to you where you want to log the data. You want to log the data in a text file, you have to write the code here. You want to log this information inside a database, you have to write the logic here. You want to send this log information to some email address. You can also do the same thing here, right? Now, once you have the log information, right, whatever you want, you can do. So here I'm just printing entity framework database activities and whatever the message, I'm just printing that message, right? So now let me run the application and see the output. Right, so you can see every statement, right? Entity framework database, uh, open connection, at what time connection is open, right? And this is the uh select statement it is executed right and then for each activity right for the parameter execution completed right closed connection open connection transaction started update statement right every information it is printing on the database right and if you don't want this thing right you can simply hide this thing right that is also possible so in this case i'm simply printing the message i'm update see guys in this case if i'm not going to update this value Right, then you will see the original value is first name updated three and the modified value is first name updated three. So in this case, do you think that it is going to update the data? Guys?
हेलो सो इन दिस केस द ओरिजिनल वैल्यू व्हेन एवर आई एम फेचिंग द डेटा दैट वैल्यू इज फर्स्ट नेम अपडेटेड 3 एंड आई एम अपडेटिंग द नेम फील्ड टू अगेन फर्स्ट नेम अपडेटेड 3 सो इन दिस केस डू यू थिंक दैट द कॉन्टेक्स्ट ऑब्जेक्ट इज गोइंग टू जनरेट द अपडेट एसक्यूएल स्टेटमेंट व्हेन एवर आई कॉल इट दिस एक्सचेंजेस मेथड नो यस बिकॉज़ द वैल्यू no why it is going to generate because the value is not updated na he is tracking what is the original value and what is the updated value value is is same then why i am going to generate the update statement does it make sense to generate the update statement whenever the value are not changed no it doesn't make sense it it is it doesn't make sense na so in this case it is not going to generate the update statement right to prove this things let me run the application and in this case you will see only the select statement right but you will not see the updated statement see only the select statement update statement is not there and this makes sense because he is tracking every information whether the property value is changed or not what is the current value what is the uh, original value whether the current value and the original value is going to be same yes same then don't update this if value is different then only update this right now i am making this to four So in this case, it is going to generate the update SQL statement, right? So now you can see the update statement is generated, right? Clear, guys? Yes. Yes. Right. So one important concept that what we need to understand is intercept database command in entity framework. What exactly this is? Let's try to understand. so we can intercept the database command executed by database object in entity framework database first approach right entity framework 6 provides the ability to intercept the context object by implementing the i command builder interface right so what exactly it means it means it, it means whatever the see behind the scene right whenever entity framework executing the database command in the database behind the scene he is only executing this three method right execute non query execute scalar and execute reader and if you work with adio.net then you know these things very well right so so in adio.net we are calling this execute non query scalar and reader method we execute our database command the same thing is going to be done by the db context object in adio.net right so we can intercept this thing by executing this method right so what exactly we are trying to do is right so we do not want this thing right we do not want to log this things or all this information right will intercept the database command how we are going to intercept the database command means right so basically we need to implement six methods we need to override six methods what are the methods how let us do this right first of all you need to create one class and that class should implement your uh, i command i db command builder right let me create a class with the name i db command interceptor right let me create one class right and let me copy this code right so here you can see uh, uh if you remember uh, we are having execute non query execute scalar execute reader right for execute non query right entity framework uses two method one is non query executed and non query executed for execute reader it is uh, this command builder provide two methods right this is one interface and in this interface if you go to the definition these are the six methods right and what is the use this method is called after a call to execute non query or one of its async counterpart is made right that, that means what now whenever the entity framework call this execute non query method right then this method is going to be executed right this method is called after a call see once the entity framework call the execute non query then this method is going to be executed right and uh, and what is h query this is before calling right so what it means now entity framework is going to call one method
entity framework, right? Entity framework called execute reader. Execute reader, right? Entity framework called the execute reader method. That means what is happening before execution, right? Before execution and what is happening after execution, right? Before execution and this is after execution, right? So what is happening with this uh, uh, before executing this command object and after executing this command object, that is what need to be tracked by these two methods, right? So executing, where is the reader? So yeah, reader executed, right? So after execution, this reader executed method is going to be executed. And before execution, this reader executing method is going to be executed, right? Similarly, if you are having execute scalar, right? Execute reader instead of execute scalar, if you entered framework using this execute scalar, then what is going to be happen? Reader executing. So in this case, scalar executing and scalar executed, right? So you can intercept these things, right? So what exactly you need to do? You need to create a class and that class would implement all the six method. And whenever the entity framework execute the respective uh, uh, method, then, then whatever the method you have specified, right? For example, uh, entity framework execute, uh, call the execute the command using the execute reader method. Then before executing the command, right, this method is going to be fired automatically. And after executing the command, this method is going to be fired automatically. And in this case also, whatever SQL statement is generated and um, executed, whether this is a execution is asynchronous, asynchronous or not asynchronous, right? Every information you can also log, right? And for that purpose, what you need to do, you need to create your own custom class by inheriting, by implementing the six method which is provided by this class, right? And the implementation is very simple. What you need to do, right? So, okay, let me in, uh, let me include the namespace so that uh, no need to type this thing again and again, right? So you can simply remove these things because this doesn't make good to repeat the namespace name again and again. Right? So the uh, the logic is the same for all the methods. So what I'm trying here doing, command inputs, right? So whenever I'm executing, right? So from this intercept context, right? It is returning each async. Each async means whether the execution is asynchronous or not. That is what you can fetch. And the command object dot command text, what command text it is executing on the database, that is what going to be written. So, so I'm creating a string value and I'm calling this log info by passing the method name. So non query executed and this command info, right? So this is the method name. Here it is going to print what command executed and whether that command is a asynchronous command or not, right? So this is what it is uh, passing here, right? So non query executed. And what uh, command uh, that is what it is going to print. The logic is same for all the method, right? But the difference that so whenever the entity framework uses uh, execution non query, before executing that non query, it is going to execute this method. After executing the non query method, it is going to execute this method. So before executing the ex uh, execute reader method, it is going to uh, execute this radar executing method and after the execute radar method is executed this is going to call this method and these things are going to happen automatically right so now what i can do is now you can come to our database right simply uh, uh, remove this thing right but before that we need to do some changes right what changes we need to do right we are intercepting the command right we are intercepting the database command then we need to configure this thing, right for uh, for configuration what you need to do you need to go to the configuration of your application right in case of a uh, console application or desktop application you will find app config file and in the case of uh, web application you will find web config file so here you need to provide the interceptor section right and you need to provide the interceptor right what is the interceptor in this case in this case my interceptor is defined in this location how you will get this right so what is your uh, database first approach this is your namespace name right and after the namespace name you need to provide your class name 
and this is my class name. And here you need to provide the namespace name, right? So once you provide this thing, now the interceptor will work, right? And now the entity framework will call the respective method, this method or this method before and after executing your command object, right? Now, uh, let me come, uh, let me remove this thing altogether. Now it is not required and I'm writing this hype here, right? So now uh, let me uh, call the method, or let me execute this step. Right. So you can see uh, reader executing, reader execute, right? So you know, if you remember, if I'm executing, if I'm getting some data from the database, then at that time, I'm uh, which adio.net method you generally call? Execute reader or execute query or execute scalar? Guys. Right. So guys, we are having three methods, right? So one is execute reader, one is execute scalar, and one is execute non query right? Whenever you are retrieving some data, then you have to use this one. If you are retrieving single scalar value, then you have to use this one. And when you are performing the DML operation, then you need to call this method or not? Right. Right. So the same method or the same functionality is also going to be implemented by the .NET framework. So in this case, you are retrieving the data or what you are doing? Retrieving the data. You are retrieving a single value or a multiple column value? Single value. Single value. Multi-column. No, multi-column. It's a this student, right? You are retrieving the student, all the column of the particular student or a single column value? All the columns. All, 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 the, all, all the column yeah. value. Then entity framework should use which method? Reader. Execute reader, right? Execute reader means, so before executing this execute reader method, the entity framework will call this reader executing. After the execute method execution is completed, then it is going to call the reader executed method, right? Now let's see, intercept on. Reader executing first it calls, and then it is a, a call this reader executed. And it is intercepting what command, right, is async? No, it is not async command. And what SQL statement it is sending to the database this. After executed, right, is async? No and what command it sent that information you can capture here, right? And now, now for the update kind of thing, right? If you are trying to update something, execute, then what SQL command, uh, uh, what method we generally use with ADO.NET, execute non-query, right? And in this case for the uh, update statement, what method it is calling first, non-query executing and then non-query executed, right? So if you go to our, this method, Right, non query executing and non query executed. The name itself thing before executing this method, after executing this method, right? Uh, before executing this reader method and after executing this reader method, right? And scalar means scalar executing and scalar executed. Clear, guys? So, in this case, yes, okay. what will happen? The unnecessary things, right? When the transaction started, when the connection opened, right? Everything is not going to be written. In this case, only the command text and whether this async method or what you want to print, that is what you are printing here. Clear? Right? If you go to this definition, uh, other, other properties are there, command text, whether the uh, uh, command type, what is the connection object, right? You can try this one. This is also. Right? Whatever the person, you just try this properties and check whatever value, which value it is returning. Right? I'm just using this command text. You can type the command type, right? Command type in this case, right? So how, how you can use the command type? So just write this one. So command text. So command type right and how you will get the command type of information so simply it's a get property so command object dot command type simply right so in this way you can also check the 
rest of the property. Clear? Yes. Right. So with this, we have completed our uh, ADO.NET database first approach. Right. So in the next session, we are going to start our in uh, 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 sorry, in the next session, we are going to start code first approach of entity framework. And now you can check uh, whatever existing project you are working, right? And uh, you just uh, try to understand whatever concept we explain or uh, whether all those concepts are available or not, or if something new is there, then please let me know. But apart from one thing, that is unity of work and the repository pattern, right? What That is what we have not yet discussed, that is what we are going to discuss in our design pattern section. Any question from anyone? Uh, yes, sir. So what? one question I have, like um, after learning the transactions and entity framework uh, uh, handling the transaction and everything, actually in in the application that I'm working in, there, there is a um, sequence of operations in the co uh, like uh, through the uh, database what it will operate like pre-validation pre-operation main core operation after that again um, post core operation like this stages will come okay. and uh, the platform is allowed us to you know plug in the plugins custom plugins that we want to suppose uh, it is a built-in application and if we want to extend that uh, feature we can write some code and we can attach that uh, plugin. See, see without looking our uh, project structure and what plugin you are using right how you are using i i, I cannot give a blindly any solution what exactly happening and how exactly happening right so without looking all these things uh, it's very difficult for me to identify what exactly your project structure right how the project, uh, I mean, what are how the different uh, plugins are, how the different components are integrated with each other, right? So, but what I can understand is there are a different steps, right? So, pre validation, execution, uh, after execution, some things you need to execute, right? Those things you can easily manage now. Any problem with those things? I mean, like, like, uh, those things, uh, my question was like how you can allow in these transactions like uh, if if those stages are there how right. how you can allow external users to or at least in this code how can we plug see, in code? see see plugin I, I don't know what plugin you are using how you are using right but uh, but in this case once you created see in this case i'm creating the context object right so can I pass this context object as a parameter to a different method? Yes. Then in using that context object, can I execute uh, the pre-validation logic, the actual database logic, the uh, after validation logic? And once all these things are completed, while I'm creating the context object, based on the response, based on the output, what the method is returning me, right? Based on that rate, uh, output, can I commit the uh, transaction and can I roll back the things? Yes. Yeah. That is what you need to do. Okay. Right. So this is nothing but your context object. You can pass this context object as a parameter. Right. And here you need to create the transaction and you need to use this context object as part of the transaction and you just need to pass this context object to the respective methods and uh, on those methods using the context object you need to do the database operations or whatever operations right and finally at one point of time you need to compute the transaction based on the uh, uh, output or based on the return value what it is receiving from the method which should indicate you whether all these things are successfully completed or failed. Right. If everything is fine, then commit the transaction, else roll back the transaction. Right. Okay. So once we develop the application, um, like again, if we want to insert some piece of code, how can we do that? Again, writing some um, a class or function and calling yeah, that. See, see the, the, there are different approaches, right? So if you know what is solid principle is, Solid principle, do you know? No, no. Any, any, anybody having any idea related to solid? Uh, 
मल्टीपल रेस्पन्सिबिलिटी बट इपन क्लोज प्रिंसिपल ओपन क्लोज प्रिंसिपल मीन वाट इट शुड ओपन फॉर एक्सटेंशन बट क्लोज फॉर मोडिफिकेशन राइट वन यू डिफाइंड वन मेथड राइट the or if you uh, defined one method then that method should open for extension but that method is closed for modification you should not modify the method for your uh, enhancement you should extend the functionality right how you are going to do that is what we are going to discuss in our solid principle right so we we are not we are not supposed to write if if we, uh, currently see uh, I'm, i'm calculating uh, i'm calculating the task right as so, a tax right currently i'm giving 15% at uh, uh, i mean uh, uh, so so different different based on the different logic right you want to provide uh, some um, now what i can say uh, so, some bonus amount right so bonus, bonus amount in the sense if the user so for for a for a particular number of user you want to give some 10% as a bonus for another particular number of user you want to give 20% as a bonus later some new concern new user ka new employee comment the uh, 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 organization and for those in, uh, employee you want to provide a different uh, uh set up or you can say different bonus right for that purpose i cannot go and uh, modify my existing method by writing eplc eplc if employee type is this uh please give the uh, bonus as 10 else if the employee type is this then give this this should not be the ideal approach right we have to think in a different manner right where we should extend the functionality but we should not modify the existing code and that is what we are going to discuss in our solid design principle and once you start discussing the design patterns then you will understand this thing very clearly right because you are just learning the concept right but how you can utilize those concept effectively right that is what you will need to understand some uh, principles some patterns right uh, uh, do you have any idea related to design patterns bargam mm. no sir actually i don't yeah i have worked in uh... right so there are uh, there are many design patterns right uh, gangopur they have provided 23 design patterns apart from that there are something called dependency injection required design pattern repository design patterns right so we are having something called the inversion of control right many things are there what we are going to learn right and once you learn those thing then you will get a better clarity better picture and better idea of uh, see design patterns are nothing but uh, what you can say how effectively you are going to utilize the oops concept right if you are good at oops concept then design pattern will not that difficult right rather it will make you how uh, effectively right you can write the code by uh, implementing the design patterns and if you are good at oops concept then you can easily use those concept right okay right so please keep patience and uh, uh, wait and every, everything we are going to discuss right so uh, but uh, uh, it will take some time because uh, you know what uh, what i can say is design patterns right most of the people most of the developer they don't know design patterns right so what already implemented in the project without understanding they are just going and working on those things right so most of the time i can see right whenever we develop some of the application some experience i'm not talking about the pressure right i'm talking about the experience guys who join the organization they are simply working on the project and if i'm asking what is this code what is this design pattern why is this design pattern they are simply blind right so so this is the thing what i always mention if you are taking some kt session from anyone right please ask them Uh, what is exactly this thing? If you are working with uh, some kind of a plugin project, right? You just ask the uh, person who gives you get what is this? How it is working, right? What is the advantages of thing? Why you are implementing this thing in this manner, right? So line by line, you have to ask and you have to clarify your code, right? And once your criticism is over, once the project is handed to you, later if anything happening, right? Any query, any issue, any bug, any announcement will come. Then you are only going to responsible for that. No one is going to say that person will tell. I have already provided a criticism. 
if you are having any issue with the criticism then you immediately let to know your manager right i'm passing uh, he's not explaining me all the concept right i'm having many very many questions related to the project structure related to the project development right related to the coding standard related to the database related to the functional flow right related to the documentation documentation is not there right so everything you have to ask from the beginning while you are taking the kt session because once the kt is over it is the industry standard once the cat is over, you are only going to be responsible for that project. No one is going to help you, right? No one in the sense, people will help you, but the primary responsible for that project is going to be you, right? If you, whatever the project you are working, right? Whatever question you asked me, instead of me, you should ask this question to the person who give the cat session to you, right? As, am I wrong or right? More than right. <laughs> <laughs> because this is the uh, uh, this is the truthness, right? In industry, right? Suppose you are working on project, some bug is come. That means uh, you are only going to be responsible to resolve that bug. Sometimes some uh, good uh, developer are there. They are going to definitely help you. But most of the time, the primary responsibility is for you only, right? And at that time, you cannot say, I have not taken the KT, I have not full information, then the reverse. No. <laughs> you have to take the blow and that's it. <laughs> right? They will ask you, why you didn't inform this to me? If you are having issue with the project uh, understanding KT session, right, you should inform me at that time only. Right? Because what happened, uh, people who are joining, they never ask or they never raise questions like this. And, and what they are, they are simply explaining the things from the higher level point of view. Uh, this is our functionality from this. We are going to store the data in this database and blah, 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 completed. But you need to understand the code that is important, right? Because by looking at the code, we can easily identify what is happening in the database. Okay, any question from anyone? Well, not about the, the course itself, but what's uh, how is going to happen uh, what's uh, how are you going to handle it next week you said something like uh, is yes, it this yes. week that you're going to have a vacation sorry i didn't understand that very well you said see, that you uh, see from see from uh, today onwards i'm traveling right so i'm traveling okay. till uh, january first right so what i have uh, planned uh, is i don't want to make you guys uh, for the 15 or 15 days on holiday I don't want like this because we are in a process, right? We should not have uh, that much of a break in between the classes, right? So what I'm planning, at least two to three classes I'm going to take per week, right? So that you should be in touch with the concept, right? And uh, I'm going to provide the documentation, whatever I'm sure providing the documentation, that is 100% I'm going to provide. The videos, what I'm uploading on uh, uh, each day, that is what I, I cannot upload because of the internet connected internet issue. Because to upload one uh, video, right, at least one GB or two GB is required, right, for me. Yeah. And uh, that is, uh, and I'm going to connect with my mobile network and uh, in mobile network. And again, uh, the limit, uh, the bandwidth is 4G. I, I mean, the uh, internet speed is not that huge that I can upload one video in 10 minutes or five minutes, right? Uh, I have tried yeah. few times earlier, right, for uploading two hour video. It is taking more than one hour or two hour using my mobile network. So I cannot sit at one place for uploading the video for two hours, right? So for that purpose, okay. I'm going to take the classes. I'm going to provide the documentation, but videos I cannot upload. Later, once I come from holiday right after Jan 2, then I can upload the videos. And you let us know in advance, when are you going to have the class? I mean, some days yeah, yeah, you will and some days you won't, yeah. you, 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 by, yeah, the, by the group. Yeah, you so see the group. In the group, okay. in the group, I'm going to upload when the classes is, when there is no classes. Okay, great, thank you. Right, because uh, I know, I, and mostly from 25th to 1st January, we are going to take leave because most of the time, at a time, they are on holiday, right? So from the, uh, the 25th December to 1st January, we should not have any class. We, we do not have any class from 25th to 1st January. The class will continue from 2nd January and uh, up to 24th December. Right. Mostly, okay. uh, mostly in the upcoming week, we will clear, take the classes and then 
then the next classes will be from January. Right, so right. we can take the classes from 2019, 2020, and 22, 23, and then we will have in the holidays. Right. Okay, guys, any more questions okay. from anyone? Oh, okay. Have a, have a good vacation. <laughs> yeah, thank you. See you. See you then. Thank you, guys. Thanks. Thank you.